wind energy is clean and green, but how healthy is it? It's like a shrieking noise, 24-7. If you lose sleep over time, it'll affect your mental health, it'll affect your physical health. This is settled science, this is not speculative. Living near wind turbines can mean troubling symptoms. Nausea. Diabetes, hypertension. Dizziness and vertigo. Heart disease. As with real estate, it's all about location, location, location. Stop the wind turbines! Stop the wind turbines! I'm Anne Marie McDonald. This Dock Zone looks at the wind rush. I saw the wind turbines on the on the ridge line there, and you know. They look beautiful in a sense, you know, from a distance, they, they really looked like a triumph of human engineering. They looked like, they looked like the future. Capturing the wind, an old idea resurrected by new technology to produce green electricity. And then as I drove closer and I got to, to where the people live there, I thought, well, gee, you know, these homes, are, they seem awfully close to these big machines, you know? These turbines are huge. They have to be to be productive. But how well can people and wind farms coexist? There is a wind boom because it works in some places. In others, wind farms are generating unexpected results. With wind power, are we pushing hard toward a greener tomorrow without fully understanding all of the consequences? What do you see? The key to a green future? An eyesore? Or a threat? I thought green energy, wonderful. We're going to help the environment. This is going to be good for everybody. It's going to be a win-win situation. But when you're kept awake one night, OK. You're kept awake two nights, okay. Then it's one week, and then it's two weeks, and then it's three weeks, and then it goes into months, and then it's a year. That tells its toll. Norma Schmidt's house is surrounded by turbines. In 2003, there were only 10 wind turbines in Ontario. By 2012, there were 1,200. And that number is expected to double in the next few years. The government is rushing to reduce the reliance on coal by investing in green energy. So what we're doing here together is building an exciting new clean energy future for ourselves and our children. And what could be cleaner than wind? The best locations for wind farms are the open spaces, but the turbines have to be close to the electrical grid. In Ontario, that puts them among family farms, and the turbines have gone up with little research into health impacts. That's created a giant rift between those who support wind power and those who don't. But it's different in the wide open spaces of Alberta. So this is the birthplace of wind power in, in Canada. I think around, uh, I'll say around 1990, the first ones went up. Southwestern Alberta is one of the places where wind works. After more than 20 years, Cowley Ridge still produces electricity, 
Although at only 660 kilowatts per machine, they are at a fraction of the bigger, newer turbines. This is wind farm heaven. A consistent wind howls out of the Crow's Nest Pass and down across Pincher Creek, where banks of turbines are positioned to catch it. It was a game that Jeff Wearmouth wanted to get in on, his own wind-powered retirement plan. I guess about, uh, about 10 years ago, I made the, the decision I wanted to get into a good, sustainable business. Here it is, I guess I'm the wind farmer now. Now we're actually on the level with the rotor. I'm sitting actually right in the main bearing. There's instruments up there that uh, tell it when it's windy and tell it when the grid is, is connected and when we can put power out. This is stationary, except the surface actually yaws. So it will automatically look for the wind, pitch, and find the optimum angles for everything to get the most power out of it. This is the rotor that actually spins with the blades that actually pitch. This one's 750 kilowatts. When it was installed in 04, it was in the top 10 uh, for biggest turbines in Canada. Now it does not even close, it doesn't even rank. And the new ones are anywhere from uh, one and a half to three megawatts. Justin Thompson is the vice president of project development for Joss Wind in Calgary. So we're, we've gone from 0.66 up to 2 megawatts. So these turbines would have produced or produced enough power for 250 to 300 houses per year. And the new turbines are over 1,000 houses per year in terms of the energy they're producing. Uh, I understand that the big manufacturers are all working on their next generation, which are around 6 megawatt machines. They're going to be huge. In Alberta, uh, the, the most of our energy still comes from coal. And I think often people uh, outside of Alberta assume that a lot of our electricity is, is hydro, which isn't the case. The, the percentage of coal is, is, is going down. There's more and more natural gas coming online. Uh, wind is still a fairly small percentage, less than 5% uh, of our energy demand. So clearly there's an interest in increasing that. These are some of the same machines that have been put up in Ontario. But there is so much space out here that they don't need to be placed near anybody's home. As a result, the anti-wind sentiment from back east is non-existent here. I think the community here is quite supportive. It's a community that's familiar with agriculture, oil and gas, and wind has slowly developed here. And I think it's rolled out in a good way, I would say. Most people, who I, I believe, that I talk to see it as a net benefit here. You know, if you have three turbines on your land, uh, you're looking at $30,000 a year, which for a rancher or farmer, that's a, a, something that, that helps to, to boost your family income. Well, you're allowed to uh, um, have a mortgage that is basically paid for by our, our windmills. And it meant that we could keep our farm in family and as a family farm unit, rather than selling off to a larger mega farm or corporation. As far as I'm concerned, they're, they're doing their job. They're, they're producing power for other people. Some of that power came off my land, which makes me feel good. People ask, you know, whose windmills are those? Well, I say they're mine, because they feel like they're mine. They're part of our place. In the Canadian West, the industry grew at a moderate speed. As the technology advanced, more turbines went up. But when the wind farms went into Ontario, they went in fast, and a lot of people weren't ready to accept them. I would not say, though, that I believe that, that wind shouldn't happen in Ontario. I think there's probably a way to do it, and I think that it's important that wind development in Ontario. It's just probably, you know, there were certainly some, some missteps. The anti-wind movement has been growing in Ontario. There are those who think they're a blot on the landscape and threaten property values. Hey, Toronto, no turbines, no way. 
Others are fighting back against what they see as a technology better suited to the wide open prairie like Alberta, rather than the tight patchwork farmland of rural Ontario. We go to different communities around this province and make sure our message is being heard loud and clear. To try and and they are worried about the health impacts that can come with industrial wind farms. Bruce County is on the shores of Lake Huron, about three hours from Toronto. The Bruce Power nuclear facility has been employing people here for years. Producing electricity is the biggest game in town. So it follows that if any place would be ready to welcome a new form of energy, it would be Bruce County. But that hasn't been the case. The opposition to wind farms is fierce. I'm surrounded by 110 industrial wind turbines. I was told we will get used to the noise. It is not a problem. It is not an issue. The only issue is nimbyism. You know, not in my backyard. And I thought, well, I don't have a problem. Put them in my backyard. Put them in my two fields. We have 13 acres. No problem. But pretty soon, Norma Schmidt, who was a retired nurse, recognized that she did have problems. Um, nausea, which was very infrequent at first. Um, ear pressure and head pressure. Much later, uh, dizziness and vertigo. Um, migraines, although I'd had migraines previously, they were very infrequent, one to two a year they became much more frequent um, and much more severe. Other people have been showing up in doctor's offices too, and their symptoms have been the same as Norma's. As a physician, once people start complaining of things, you start looking at what might be causing this. And part of our investigation is we said, well, we'll hold a meeting both north and south and see who comes and what what their stories are. Had one of the experts from the Ontario Agency for Health Promotion Protection uh, who came up, he's the environmental, in charge of their environmental division, and he said he'd never seen anything like it either. That so many people upset by these things. And very consistent symptoms. We need more information about what is this hazard so we can mitigate it. I'm not against green energy at all. But I don't think we should be injuring people, even if there are susceptible five or 10%. We need to know who those people are and protect them like we do on any other hazard that we know about. As it now stands, the Ontario policy follows the ruling of Dr. Arlene King, the Provincial Medical Officer of Health. King released a report in 2010 that said, there is no scientific evidence to date to demonstrate a causal association between wind turbine noise and adverse health effects. When it comes to people's health, the wind companies take their cues from the province. When it really comes down to whether they're sick or not, I mean, we have to defer to the doctors. And there are now many, many reports out there from chief medical officers of Ontario or, or different uh, municipalities that can't find any physical cause and effect between the machines and, and uh, these symptoms that people report. So uh, we're really stuck on relying on that. The wind approval process in Ontario was rewritten in 2009 to make it easier for wind developers. It's still pretty stringent. They need to prove that the turbines won't harm the environment. But there have been no extensive human health studies in Ontario. When someone comes to me and says, you need to do a health study before you do this, and I say, sure, no problem, I'd love to do that. I'm spending millions of dollars of, of other people's money to do this, let's do a health study. What does that entail? That entails getting a control group and studying them and have them willing to study for 10 years to see what their health is. Then putting some wind turbines up and doing the same thing 
for 10 years and then trying to understand all the other things that can impact what could affect their health. And in 20 years, I won't be here, you won't be here, which means it will never happen. So health study before a wind turbine. Well, that means do not do it here. Job number one may be to get the turbines up generating power, but there is only so much space for wind farms and people to coexist in this part of Ontario. When, when they get right up into, into high gear, my ears are, they go past ringing, it's like a shrieking noise, 24-7. It'll vary from, uh, the closest one is behind our house, 900 meters behind the bush, and it'll, just a hmm, hmm, hmm. At different times, they sound like different things. They can sound like a jet engine. They can sound like a swoosh, 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 and stop. And you've got to realize, if you hear like a sound swoosh, swoosh, that's okay. But if you hear a swoosh, swoosh, and stop, and a swoosh, swoosh, and stop, this is torture. If you live next to a turbine, there is no volume control, no off switch. Ontario's Green Energy Act was designed to bypass municipalities. The permission to put up a wind farm comes from the provincial government. There are considerable subsidies for wind farm developers, so it makes investing in wind attractive. But it's expensive and complicated for people who are against the turbines to defend themselves. I think we've built an awful lot of turbines, an awful lot of towers in very little time. So I think people get afraid when things move that quickly and when we haven't had time to really absorb the change. So there's a bit of that going on. There's unknowns about health implications. Does it make you sick? It's an annoyance, stress. Uh, of, a, of somebody coming to change the area of your little piece of heaven. Uh, it causes people stress, and stress causes people sick. You know, around the, the lake shore here, right now we have 200 turbines within, uh, within a 10 minute drive of Kincardine or 20 minute drive of Kincardine. They're spread out along the way but uh, the hospital isn't full of people. But is Ontario's power grid even designed to carry the electricity from wind turbines? The grid was set up to take power from a few stationary points. Now we're talking about taking power from hundreds or possibly even thousands of points. Coming up next, a serious load on an outdated system. There are some 80 turbines on Wolf Island near Kingston, Ontario. The island sits right where Lake Ontario drains into the St. Lawrence. All the wind that's coming across Lake Ontario gets funneled across this spot. These things generate power about 25% of the time, probably, uh, because there's times when the wind doesn't blow and there's times when the wind might be blowing too hard or, or in a gusty sort of a fashion and they just can't get good power out of it. And that's one of the biggest knocks against the wind industry. Wind farms only generate power part of the time. And what they do generate cannot be effectively stored for use later on. That technology doesn't exist yet. But the appetite for electricity continues to grow. The cities in southern Ontario are rapidly expanding, and the province can't afford to have any lapses in the delivery of power. So Ontario has had to build supporting generating systems like this natural gas power plant outside of Toronto. Traditionally, electricity in Ontario has come from three sources. 
hydro, mainly from Niagara Falls, nuclear, and coal-fired generators, which are on their way out. The grid was set up to take power from a few stationary points, say 10, 20 stationary points across the province, and distributed it out to millions of customers. Now we're talking about taking power from hundreds or possibly even thousands of points through the province and going out to millions of customers. It's an immensely complex kind of a problem. You know, power doesn't just flow in any old direction through the wires, it goes from place to place. So you have to plan where it's coming in and where it's coming out. A new power corridor has gone up from Bruce County to the outskirts of Toronto. 182 kilometers of high voltage wire with capacity for more nuclear and more wind. Meanwhile, wind developers have plugged into the existing hydro lines to carry the power from the turbines into the wider grid system. But as Warren Maybe says, the increased flow of power from multiple sources could exceed the grid's limits. The power is supposed to travel from a big source like Niagara Falls, through a transformer, and down the line to individual homes. The power is not supposed to hop on board from a wind turbine any place along the line and head back down the other way. But that's what's happening, and it's testing the tolerance of the system. And the variation in noises that come from the turbines is testing the tolerance of the people who live near them. I'm going to play three different sounds. They're all at 80 hertz. Dr. Michael Nissenbaum. They're all going to be at the same decibel level. Which one would you rather spend time with? Wind turbines emit different sound patterns depending on which way and how hard the wind is blowing. The different characteristics bother people in different ways. The real question is, do wind turbines cause noise? Yes. Do they cause sleep deprivation? Yes. Is sleep deprivation a problem? Well, of course it is. Well, therefore, we have a completely plausible chain of causation here. Dr. Michael Nissenbaum is a radiologist and public health advocate. He did a survey of how turbines affect the health of people living near the Mars Hill wind farm in Maine. He asked them if their quality of life had changed since the 28 turbines went up. And we got results that showed that there was an unequivocal uh, deterioration in people's mental health.